let's get a look at this trench and the formwork that I've done so far. Show you where I'm at. I've had two concrete, concrete contractors come out today and look at my formwork and both were perfectly fine pouring concrete in what I've done. So here is the upper form in the front. You can see I've just stacked limestone in besides these. Now last week when I showed my forms, all I had done was set them in here, right? And got them to the level. I had done no reinforcing on these. And people were, rightfully so, concerned that these were going to blow out. Because with it, any with no reinforcement, uh, there's a good chance that they would. I have a feeling that these aren't going anywhere, right? So here's the lower section. Get around my tripod here. Now I decided to stop my formwork here instead of running the whole length of the trench I just decided it's not worth the risk there was only thing I was gaining here was appearance really uh, you know this was never a money saving thing I mean you're talking no concrete really uh, maybe a little weight but uh, then again you know somebody brought up the fact that the dirt that you stack behind there will probably weigh you know close to what the concrete would Really, for me, it was more, I want a footer that is of the size that is specified on my engineer's drawing. And for me, it didn't need to be any bigger than that. Anything would be a waste. Although, pouring to the ground, you can see I've got some big holes there. And the texture of the side of the trench, I guess, would allow the concrete to, you know, form to the side of the trench. It'll be more... Uh, less likely to move not that this is going anywhere but you get the idea probably just a better idea to pour to the earth right it's a form that doesn't blow out normally so let me show you the back here where i've got some issues that i know i'll have for one is getting these plates out that i've drove in the ground these i had to drive in straight due to there was nowhere else to drive them because of all the rocks to keep concrete from seeping behind the forms and encasing them I'm not done here i still got to this form is a little tweaked, so i got to push it in a bit. It's got a little bow in it there. This done the same way, driven into the earth. Just keep concrete from getting back. Corners really blowed out here uh, because of the way we had to dig it. And I'm going to stick insulation down in here when I'm done. And then backfill this with a flash material that's supposed to have really good compaction. It'll be the same scenario up here you can see limestone I'm worried more about the bottoms of the forms than i am the tops that's where the pressure is going to be the highest use spray foam to fill in some of the gaps and stuff they don't have to be perfect right they just got to be good enough to where they don't start pouring they'll self-seal so this concrete can't get behind here and then limestone again So my forming's pretty much done. I'm about ready to get started putting some rebar down in the trench. I need four runs, basically. Two runs down at the bottom, two runs up near the top of my footing. And I've got a selection of materials here. I picked up some number three rebar, which is three-eighths of an inch, that I potentially may use. I'm not for sure uh, on my up to hold up my upper run. I've got some number five bar, which is five-eighths of an inch. And then I've got some number six bar, which is three three quarters of an inch this is what my buddy, buddy al brought and in, in case you're wondering number four bar is half inch it goes kind of like that pretty easy to remember actually to tie this stuff i've got some pre-bent wires that already have little loops on the end that you use with this little special tool here to twist them up i've also got the channel lock rebar or the tie pliers and just a spool of loose wire to hold this stuff up off the bottom of the trench because the rebar won't do its job if it's sitting on the on the you know, floor. It really needs to be suspended up in the concrete to do its uh, thing and not get corroded. I'm going to be using these plastic rebar chairs. I picked up some of these metal ones, not a bunch of them, but just to try them, the spacing and stuff. I don't think I'm going to go with that. I think I'm going to go with these. They hook to the bar easy, although you could wire tie those together. I think I'm going to go with the plastic ones. I've also got two rebar benders. Both are about 40 years old. Uh, I've got a right-handed version and a left-handed version. I'm much better with the right-handed version. Uh, let me show you those real quick.
for my new viewers who are wondering why it sounds like we're standing next to a waterfall. We kind of are. Hopefully this works. Welding, stick welding anyway. Like welding in general with holes in your pants, it's probably not the best idea. Not only, you know, you get the arc flash on your knees, but that slag gets pretty hot, especially when it falls down into your boot. This should work, I think. needs more ass.
So I've got quite a bit of number four rebar that I have to cut for my transverse bars. I want to use this little evolution chop saw simply because it's a lot quicker than the bandsaw that I have to use at the moment. This was sent to me, and when I showed it originally on the channel, people said don't cut rebar with it. You'll damage the blade, because these blades are about 100 bucks a piece, I think. $80, whatever. Close enough. Well, they sent me an extra blade with this, and I want to see if that's true. This blade should cut rebar just fine. It's carbide, as long as I don't force it through the material. Yeah, that's what I want to use it for, so that's what we're going to try, right? We'll see if it lasts. So that's a pretty good handful of cuts there. I looked at this blade, I didn't see any damage with it. But I think it's kind of the same idea as the abrasive chop saws. I've seen people turn an abrasive disc into dust in you know just a few minutes, and then I've seen them last you know, quite some time. I think it's the way that people cut. You know, just let the, let the blade do the cutting, and all you have to do is keep up with it with feed, a little bit of feed pressure, that's it. Keep it engaged in the work. It's funny how the YouTube comment section works when it comes to controversial topics like construction. You know, there's a hundred thousand ways to do something. And if you don't do it the way that Bobby Joe does it, then you don't know what you're doing, right? Or if you do it to an accurate, or if you try to do it to an accuracy level above what he works, then you're wasting your time because it doesn't need to be that good, right? But if you do it to a lesser degree of accuracy than he does it, then you're just a hack. It reminds me of you know, the guy that's driving behind you who wants to go faster than you want to go down the road, he's an idiot, right? But the guy that's in front of you driving slower than you want to go, he's an idiot as well. You just can't win, you know? So anywhere where two bars overlap, my engineer specified that that overlap be at least two feet, and I'm assuming that's so, you know, once it's encased in concrete, it kind of acts as one bar. It's not a weak spot. And for my transverse bars, what's going to keep these bars spaced at the distance that I want them, I'm going to just do it every two feet. I think that's, that's good enough. That wasn't specified on the drawing, so that's what I'm going to roll with. So some of this rebar has some places where the rust is starting to flake. I mean, for the majority of it, it's perfectly fine to use, right? I just want to get that real loose stuff off of it and keep it out of the mud as best as I can. And before I'm done, I'll take a broom through there and brush off it. It'll be dry and I'll brush off any of the stuff that's stuck on it.
So my non-expert opinion on these two tools that are used for the same thing, wire tying. This, you buy the pre-bent wires, you spin them by hand. I am faster with this, although I find that usually when I feel like that I'm getting them tight enough, or just tight enough, I usually twist the heads off the wire. It's a little frustrating, but it is faster. It helps when you don't have three hands. But the wire tying pliers, the channel lock pliers, you know, they have the cutters. They double as just a regular set of pliers, so in the future these will be far more handy in the toolbox than this thing. And I just feel like I have more control with this. Plus you can use it to knock over your sharp ends of your wires when you're done. So, in you know, hindsight, I would have just bought these, not wasted my time with this. Although, you know, it's, it's got its place, but I like these better. Mm -hmm. You're a cutie. <laughs> so I'm just going through and straightening up this rebar that I'm going to be using for the upper run. Got the lower run done. Just trying to get it straight before I wire wheel it off. A lot of people noticed that I didn't post a video last week. I probably got 50 plus emails asking, you know, is everything okay? Is the family all right? Are you still alive? I assure you, I am still alive. But last week was just really busy, along with this week as well. I have a day job. This is not my full-time gig, right? YouTube is a hobby, and this is just a project of mine. I have a full-time job that I have to work at to feed the family. So. I feel fortunate that I have a job. I know a lot of people with what all is going on are not so fortunate, so I'm not complaining. But I'm having to work remotely, which is not normal for me. It's adding two to two and a half hours to my commute every day just to get to work, which really cut into my time, along with dealing with contractors and you know all the other things that go along with you know, having a family. So I didn't have the time, to be honest. It probably bothers me. You know, more than it bothers anybody. I normally don't miss. So this is the Wilson Model 4JR Rockwell tester that I got from my buddy Al a few weeks ago. Definitely if you're doing any knife making, you know, heat treating, and you want to make sure that your parts are within the range that they need to be, then something like this obviously could tell you. And it's set up right now to test hardness in the C scale. And it works under a simple principle, I guess. Now, I'm no expert on this, but from what I've seen at the internal workings of this, what it does is it just presses this specifically shaped diamond, in this penetrator's case anyway, into a part at a controlled rate with a fixed amount of weight and transfers that into a reading on the dial that gives you the hardness of the part. So I've got a piece of high speed steel here. We'll set it up here, we'll load it up, test it, and I'll show you how it works. So here's a close look at the penetrator, or what's pressed into the work to determine the hardness of the part. And I'm assuming that's a diamond. And here's a little box that it come in. This was sent to me by Stephen Lang over at Shark River Machine. When I got this uh, hardness tester, it didn't have a penetrator in it. Now you can get different ones depending on the scale that you want to test. But uh, this one's for the C scale. So thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Go check him out on YouTube. It's his channel. And there's a little closer look at that. Just a very specifically shaped point that's pressed into the work. So this is a piece of T15 Basco Supreme. I think this is a tungsten, alloy tungsten high speed steel. It's just a cutting tool that you'd use on the shaper or on the lathe. And from previous experiences, me messing with this machine, testing other high speed steels, this should test probably 60 to 65 Rockwell C. So I'm just going to preload this, bring it, bring the work up into the penetrator and just touch it and then preload it a specific amount which on this machine I believe it's just one rotation which brings our little pointer I'll get you in and get you a closer closer shot onto the little black dot then we'll unload it it'll press the penetrator into the work and then flip this handle down here and that'll give us a reading and uh, tell us how hard it is So there's a little handle that you use to set your zero, just controlled through cables up to the, the bezel there. 
So it's loaded. Now I want to release the weight. And I'll let that needle settle for a minute to give me an accurate reading. Then I flip this handle and that'll give me the reading up here uh, in uh, C scale. So now I'm going to release the lever and it should give us a reading of how hard that thing is. So 65 Rockwell C. That's what it's saying anyway. How accurate that is I'm not exactly for sure. But from the best of my understanding that's the way it works and that's probably about right. So I've got three little spots there. That's the indentions that Penetrator made on this thing. I ran three tests just to make sure that you know, I was getting a consistent reading. And uh, it was. So if you get power spec from heat treat and see those little dots, the little indentions, that's what that's from. So here's the weights. There's three weights. You can take off the upper two to change the scale that you're in. And they just hang on a beam that's here that magnifies the weight out on the end of the penetrator here. And under this cover here, let me get you a little better shot, you can see the oil dampener that's in here that just controls the rate at which that weight is applied to the part. So here's the oil damper. Just controls the rate at which the weight drops onto the penetrator and I'm assuming it's adjustable. Some linkages and stuff in here. It's obviously a fairly sophisticated piece of equipment that everything needs to work together in line in order to give you the proper reading. So when you buy one of these you really do take a chance. You know lots of times there's no guarantee whether they work or not and can get messed up in you know transport and all that I'm sure. So this thing will have to be checked with some accurate test pucks to make sure that it's correct but it's pretty neat actually the way that everything kind of works together to give you that uh, reading. So there's a look at the Rockwell hardness tester and just my best understanding of how they work. I don't have a background in, in that kind of thing but pretty neat and I'm glad to add it to the shop. I can't wait to get everything in line, get me an oven, do a little heat treating and actually you know, test my parts with it. So I think it'll be a good tool to add to the shop. So we've all heard the stories, probably tribes back in history dancing a special dance in order to make it rain. They do the rain dance, right? Well, over months of testing, I believe that I found the secret to either making it rain or making it stop. It's pretty simple. All I have to do, if I want it to rain, is to put this tarp up. If I want it to stop raining, all I gotta do is get three quarters of the way done dropping this tarp and it'll stop. It's amazing the way it works out, but it definitely seems to be the case. So basically when it comes to carpentry and stuff, I own three different levels, or at least I did up till today. I've got a really nice Johnson six foot level that hangs on the wall almost 100% of the time because I don't frame houses and stuff and I don't reach for the six foot level every time I want to check something small. I've got a two foot Craftsman cast aluminum level that I picked up at a flea market, I don't know, like four or five years ago. It's kind of bent, but I trust it for general stuff, right? And at least I do until I drop it. Then I have to stop what I'm doing, check it, because the vials are not held in here very securely and it will move. Ask me how I know. You can spend a lot of time getting accurate readings with it if you're not careful. And then a cheap torpedo level that I trust only for picture frames or stuff of that uh, level of importance. So I wanted a good set of levels, right? I've been keeping my eyes open for a while. I paid just like anybody else would for these. This is not a product endorsement. I just been researching levels. I found this set at a good price and I bought it. I wanted a good four foot level. I wanted a good two foot level and I also wanted a reliable torpedo level. So let me show you what I got. I'm happy to own these and I want to share them with you. So this set happened to come in a really nice carry case with extra pockets I guess if you want to expand on the set of levels. Get some ones of different sizes. And this is the two foot 24 inches or 61 centimeter. Uh, these have a level of accuracy or at least this one of 0 0.029 degrees over 72 inches and I think I read that's a 32nd of an inch, which is pretty good. Probably a level of accuracy that's not even 
required for most type construction work, but appreciated, obviously. Now these are Mason's levels. You can see they have extra bump guard on the top to bump them around with the trowel when you're trying to level your block. I didn't set out to get Mason's specific levels, but for what I paid for these, I wouldn't argue, right? Um, pretty nice. I believe the vials on these are machined and their accuracy is lifetime guarantee. Here's the little bullet or torpedo level. And I believe it's the same 0 0.029 degrees. Uh, this is 10 inch or 25 centimeter. Pretty nice. The fit and finish on these is about as good as you're going to get. Really strong rare earth magnets. And then the last one, or the biggest one, also has the bump guards on top. So it is a mason set, like I said. Made in Germany. 48 inches or 120 centimeters. Same accuracy. Uh, 0 0.029 degrees over uh, 72 inches. So really nice. Let me get you a little better look at these. The fit and finish on them. Nice. See those bump, bump guards just to protect from impact. Truing up your block. Now obviously you can use these just like any other level. It's just an extra level of protection. So that extra bit of confidence that you get from a quality tool is worth something to me. I mean we've all probably worked with tools that are subpar, or not that great, that we don't trust. And it's always nice when you pick up a tool, it's got a good feel to it, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And you don't have to second guess it all the time. So I'm glad to have these, and I, chances are I'll probably have them for the rest of my life anyway. It's a nice set. So this has actually worked pretty well once this job's done. I'll just cut these pins off this bar. <laughs> you know, it won't have hurt a thing. Just a cheap spud bar, a pry bar, and some some pins, some three quarter inch pins. Inspectors are here. Absolutely not. It's horrible. What do you think, Juan? He's inspecting. He's going to shoot it down. <laughs> huh? He's going to shoot it He's inspecting my forms. Just make sure this box is going to go. Make things work for Yeah. Is that going to work, peanut? Walnut. Walnut and peanut. Walnut. What do I have to do to pass inspection walnut? 
move that rock around. Yeah, this rock's gotta go. That rock's gotta go. Yeah, the rock's gotta go. <laughs> Like Dad. <laughs> so having messed with this wire for a couple days, I want to show you what has worked for me. I don't have a reel for this, so I'm just pulling it off of the spool. You know, probably five or eight runs. Got the cut end right there. Just take my pliers. Just cut those rings or those loops. Then that that leaves me with a bunch of equal links. And rings. Then I take those, grab it by the split end, and you know, grab directly across and just pull it a little bit and then bend it. And then that gives me you know, a double run of wire there that I can use either with the pliers or with the uh, one handed twister. And I'll show you an example real quick. That's just what I wind up, wound up doing after messing with this stuff for a little while. So if I want to use one of these wires with the twister, just take it and wrap it around like that. Hook one end into the to the tool and then bend these over like that. And that works pretty well. So it looks pretty good so far. I used a mix of the metal chairs and the plastic chairs. Just worked out better. Gotta clean all the loose junk out of here. And just finish everything up and then it'll be ready for concrete. Well, I think it looks pretty good. Happy with the progress that I made considering the time that I've had available to work on this. All I've got to do to finish it, I wish I could say that I was finished, but I'm not, is the upper runs in the front and back step. And that's it. Of course, i got to clean out the trench, do the details, but then it'll be ready for concrete. I'm happy to say that I've got some guys that are wanting to do this job, so in the next week or two, hopefully sooner, the stars align, I'll have some concrete in here. And then once it sets up, then I'm going to put in my vertical, or my verts, that run through my block. That's going to be after the fact. Those will be epoxy set. My engineer said that, that was perfectly acceptable to do, so that's the way I'm going to do it. It just seems easier to me than trying to wire tie a bunch of verts in here, keep them in position while you're trying to pump this full of concrete. I think it just leaves less room for error, at least in my opinion. Uh, anyway, I'm not experienced at doing this kind of stuff, so that's just my thoughts. That's it. Thanks to anybody who sent me an email last week. I appreciate it uh, regarding me not posting. Uh, a lot of people are concerned because that's not uh, that's not normal for me to miss. But like I say, the truth is that I just had to work. Uh, when it comes uh, to choosing your your job or uh, your hobbies, uh, hopefully you choose your job because they're in shorter supply today than they were a few months ago, and I'm thankful to be working. So that's it. Thanks to anybody who supported me on this project. You can believe I appreciate that. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, obviously, my subscribers. That's it. Thanks for watching, guys. And I'll see you next time.